the Wade Center's podcast. The podcast of Wheaton College. Once again, that reminds me of a George McDonald principle. Rather than seeing is believing, it's believing is seeing. Yes. Yeah. Curdy can't see Queen Irene in the attic because he doesn't believe there's anything happening up there. It takes him a while to see her. A rule just momentarily saw the palace yeah. where uh, Psyche is living with the god Cupid. But she poo-poos it and puts it out of her mind and doesn't even mention it to the yeah. fox. So once again, we have that principle that believing is seeing. That's actually one of the most humorous parts. You're in this beautiful glory new Narnia <laughs> and they think everything is straw and they think you know they yeah uh, they just insist upon seeing things according to their preconceptions yeah. welcome to the Wade podcast this is Crystal Downing co-director of the Wade Center along with my husband David Downing who joins me along with our producer Aaron Hill for our discussion of the last book of the Narnia Chronicles. We've had a fantastic time doing this seven episode series and we're really excited to share our final thoughts about this final novel. So David, I understand that even though this novel is so obviously about the end times, it actually wasn't the last book he wrote. So explain why. Well, had a lot of trouble with Magician's Nephew, and he started it second, but he put it aside several times and wrote all the other chronicles. And after he'd done the last battle, he knew that the chronicles were complete. So he went back and finished Magician's Nephew, which is the creation of Narnia. As I said earlier, the first shall be last. The creation <laughs> story doesn't come in his composition process until the very end. So he composed this in about three months in 1953. It won the Carnegie Medal in 1956. He wrote to the illustrator, Pauline Baines, and said, I consider this to be our medal. Mm -hmm. He thought that the illustrations were an important part of the books, and so he thought they should share the award. That's really sweet. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the fact that he is using this narrative to capture his sense of what the end times will be like. And I don't know about the other two of you, but I grew up with a very oppressive sense of the end times mm where people were writing about all the signs and they're reading the signs of the end times. So it's kind of interesting because this whole novel starts with people reading signs, misreading them on purpose. Oh, yeah. And I, we have a relative who actually, at the start of COVID, sent out an email to all her uh, family saying that this is a sign of the end times. Oh, wow. COVID. Yeah, I've that, heard that vaccine passports are going to be the new mark of the beast. Oh, every, every, interesting. Every four or five years, there's a new thing that comes out and it's like, oh, this is the mark of the beast. It was credit cards. Yeah, that happened to me when I got a microchip uh, embedded in my forehead. <laughs> Everybody said, I don't know if that's, I said, no, no, don't worry about it. It's just for convenience. Well, and periodically, of course, there are these end time prophecies, even right after the French Revolution in the 17, well, 80s. started 89 um, and then 1790s, people, Christians were proclaiming this was the sign of the end times, especially yeah. when the revolutionaries renamed Notre Dame Cathedral, which is, of course, built to honor Christ. They renamed it the Temple of Reason. Oh, and yeah. it's almost like the puzzle donkey in The Last yeah. Battle being covered up with this false lion's coat. So the new god of the 18th century, of course, was the god of reason, and they call yeah. it the Enlightenment. And we're throwing off the superstitions of Christianity. Yeah. Voltaire actually once said, crush the vile thing about Christianity. Yeah. So people think there is an unusual amount of anti-Christian sentiment today, but this is nothing new. Yeah. So reading this novel just made me luxuriate in the idea of Aslan, of Christ welcoming us into his kingdom. And I wonder if you had some of the same experiences reading this. Well, I had a student, we we're talking about what's your favorite chronicle and what's your least favorite chronicle. Mm -hmm. And one of my students said, my least favorite chronicle is the first half of Last Battle and my most favorite chronicle is the second half of Last Battle. Uh, oh. That's good. So it's depressing when people are being killed and trees are being cut down and yeah. the army is being destroyed. Yeah. But then when you get to the new Narnia, it's such a glorious image of what being with God might be like. 
Yeah. I found that a lot of the things that Lewis portrays here in the story were very relevant. So the one that stood out to me that was sort of a reoccurring thing is where they keep using the line, uh, he's not a tame lion. Yes. Right. Right. And it reminded me of the way that we do that with certain scripture verses. And so we'll say things like, you know, well, the Lord works in mysterious ways. And they yeah. use that in the novel as a way to explain away non-Aslan-like actions. Right. And so they say, well, of course he wouldn't do it that way because he's not a tame lion. And they use that to create this smoke screen to like deceive themselves into believing something right. the opposite. Right. And then it ends up backfiring on them when Tyrion tries to get the dwarfs back on his side. Right. He uses that line and... And uh, it backfires. And it just reminded me of all those things that we do and those sayings that we use in the church and they kind of become a trope. Or uh, related to this is using truth because he's not a tame lion. Lion. So they are um, appropriating the truth in order to achieve their own purposes mm -hmm. and using it. It's like perverting the sign. Yeah. And it's interesting that End Times is about an antichrist. Yeah. It's about someone who appears as an angel of light. So here it's using the Bible to justify their own interests. Yeah. And that has happened throughout the history of Christianity, of yeah. course. The the line that stood out to me at the beginning is when Runewit shows up and he's trying to explain everything that's happening. And he says, you know, I've been looking at the stars and the stars have not said that Aslan is coming. Right. And then I think it's Jewel says, I wonder where, whether Aslan might not come, though all the stores foretold otherwise. He is not the slave of the stars, but their maker. Is it not said in all the old stories that he is not a tame lion? And as soon as their thinking goes in that direction, mm -hmm. they put themselves in the situation where they can't really discern the truth anymore because right. they've used this statement, he's not a tame lion, and it undermines everything that would normally tell them what is going on. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that confusion and that chaos and the inability to discern the truth, Lewis does a good job of portraying. That right, I think right. Yeah, there's an opening line of a George McDonald sermon that our God is not a tame God. Ooh. So I think Lewis is adapting that. And in line which in the wardrobe, it's true and it's liberating to realize that well, God is is not safe, but He's good. I mean, yes. But now, obviously, it's been perverted here. Lewis said in his survey, he wrote to a a, a girl about what he meant to do in in all seven chronicles. And he said, obviously, this is the book of Revelation in Narnia. And he specifically says that the ape shift is the Antichrist. So he's pretty explicit in this right. novel about yeah. biblical motifs getting yeah. into the story. Yeah. yeah. But you see them later on, then they ask the question, how could Aslan be commanding such dreadful things? And Tyrion says, right. he is not a tame lion. Right. And you just go, no, no, listen to your gut, you know, and right. it, they have a hard right. time figuring out what's going on. Why would Aslan do this, you know? Lewis said in the letter, if there's ever a paradox or a contradiction between God's goodness and something else like predestination or sovereignty, he said the ultimate principle has to be God's goodness. Mm. He felt that was the bedrock mm -hmm. upon which our faith is based. Yes, yeah, that definitely. God is love. We are explicitly told that. And just the very idea of the Trinity confirms that God is love because God is three persons in one. So love is inherent to God's very nature, these three persons, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, who love each other and then love the world. Yeah. Well, in the opening of the novel, we're introduced to uh, the ape and to Puzzle the donkey. And they have this really kind of odd codependent relationship yes. going on. Right. Yes. Um, what's going on with that? And, uh, and, I have to be honest, the one thing that I struggle with this novel is the ape doesn't seem as self-possessed and like he has everything laid out as a plan in the beginning of the story. And then later on, it seems that he does. Let's talk about the ape a little bit and his right, relationship with right. Puzzle. Well, once again, uh, Lewis drew upon Aesop's fables quite a bit in Narnia. And there's an uh, Aesop's fable where a donkey finds a lion's skin and puts it on his back. Oh, yeah, And he is. pretends to be a lion. I forgot about that. Yeah, but they all say, speak to us, speak to us. And he just brays like a donkey and they all <laughs> laugh. So the point of the story is if you're trying to pretend to be a lion, don't speak. You're going you're gonna to blow your cover. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. he's taking the book of Revelation, but also the twilight of the gods in Norse mythology, but also Aesop's fables. Once again, a fascinating blend of different traditions. Yeah. And different what is from the twilight of the gods? When the world ends and all the stars oh, fall out of gotcha. the sky. Okay. And then yeah. the water rises up, this great giant. Uh -huh. up, I mean, Father Time wakes up. And a lot of that is more like the uh, twilight of the gods than it is uh, like the book of Revelation. What 
Twilight of the Gods is for our uh, listeners? That is a Norse tradition, which the opera composer Richard Wagner turned into a, a ring cycle. And it has to do with, in Norse mythology, the gods were not eternal. There would be a point at which the giants and the monsters go to war with the gods. One of them is Finris Ulf, who we met, you know, Finris mm. Wolf, who we yeah. met in Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe. And so the, the, they had a very pessimistic worldview. They thought even the gods themselves would, would have an ending time. Yeah. Mm. So the ape and, and the donkey. I uh, want to go back, though, oh. to your question about the ape and his personality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I was wondering if C.S. Lewis might have been inspired by his relationship with Mrs. Moore in terms of the way the ape manipulates Puzzle to get him to do things. Uh. And the ape would say, well, if you thought of anybody besides yourself, you would recognize that you need to do this. And poor Puzzle is just made <laughs> to feel like he is a defense deficient, I was going to say human being, a deficient donkey. (laughs) Talking beast. Do you think there could be some of that? I do wonder about that. People said that it was too bad that Lewis's adoptive mother, Mrs. Moore, took up so much of his time. Uh, She wanted him to do dishes, even though they had a maid, and bring her a hot water bottle. And she often talked about her health problems. And she seemed very manipulative. And people said it was, you know, if it hadn't been for Mrs. Moore, uh, Lewis could have gotten so much more writing done. And I kind of go, actually, I think Mrs. Moore gave him quite a bit of the material. (laughs) There's a mother in great divorce who's yes. grieving the loss of her son and says, I did everything for him, which Mrs. Moore said in the letter. Yeah. Until we have faces, he says, part of O'Rule's problem with possessiveness, it's like a person whose family member gets religion and suddenly they feel like, well, they're not completely mine anymore. Yeah. They haven't. And uh, that's the way Mrs. Moore was about Lewis becoming a Christian. Mm. Yeah, that desire so, to control somebody mm, and yeah. to sort of force them to depend on you. And then they make them feel guilty for, you know, things that aren't in their control. Or right. Something mm-hmm. like that. Which is an interesting image for the Antichrist that you respond not out of love Mm. for what Christ has done for you, but you respond out of guilt and, oh, I have to do this to honor the great God who controls me. Here's a great uh, example of what we're talking about that reminded me of Mrs. Moore. So Shift the Ape says, oh, you are unkind puzzle. If you're tired, what do you think I am all day long? While, while you've been having a lovely, refreshing walk down the valley, I've been working hard to make you a coat. My paws are so tired I can hardly hold these scissors. And just, <laughs> I've done this and this and this for you. Yeah, the guilt. In order to manipulate. Yeah. What worries me, Crystal, is you were so convincing and using that <laughs> whiny, manipulative tone. <laughs> Do not question she who must have it. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Well, this is a tip, I think, for young writers is try to put yourself in a very difficult domestic situation. (laughs) Because you may find material for your fiction uh, in that relationship. <laughs> no, but Lewis does. We have talked about his emotional intelligence and you can see mm, how right. he, he, he's able to pick up on things. And I think one of the best things about his writing is the way that the different characters interact with one another um, and the sort of uh, control and uh, leadership and authority in the relationships that he has in the stories. And it's obvious that he pays attention to those things in the real world, like in The Magician's Nephew with the cabbie. And he's very kind of like, oh, I shouldn't right. be in charge. And there's just a, a a lot of that in the novels that reminds you of real life in a way that feels very real mm-hmm. and true to your own experience. Yeah, he, that's part of the charm of the Narnia Chronicles is there's so much depth of characterization, even in short stories yeah. uh, that are pretty straightforward plot-wise. But there's so many memorable characters. We, we have, we've met different kinds of bad. We've met Edmund Bad, and then we met Eustace Bad. On, yeah. and, mm-hmm. and the witches, of course. And this is a different kind of bad character than we've seen before. Very that's manipulative. Very and, you don't get the sense that they're redeemable in the way that some of the other characters mm-hmm. are right. redeemable. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. obviously there's the White Witch and the Green Lady, but the ape here definitely stands out in mm-hmm. his irredeemability. And also right. Rabidash in uh, the horse in his brain. Right. Well, and using God's name to get what you want, and that's slightly different than people um, using the Bible, but there's the incident where the ape says, I want, I, I mean, Aslan wants some more nuts. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Right. Yes. And it reminds me of something that happened to my mother when she was at a Christian college. And she had two different guys tell her, God wants me to marry you. God told me he wants <laughs> yeah, me to be God my wife. Yeah, God told me, you're supposed to be my wife. 
And luckily for me, because neither of them was my father, she said to both of them, huh, well, God didn't tell me the same thing. <laughs> yeah. He and thinks he'd check in with both of us on yeah. something that yeah. important. There's, there's a but, lot of that that goes around in Christianity, though. I know, yeah. I know. Yeah. And these men knew that my mother was a very earnest earnest Christian. Mm. And when she went off to a Christian college, it really filled her with the desire to serve the Lord. And it's 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 a more subtle kind of, and I don't think they meant to manipulate her. No. But I think that is one of the temptations that we, and I've, I'm sure all of us have done this, fall into this sense of using the Bible, using Christianity to get what will satisfy our own yeah. interests and desires. Yeah. We change I want or I need into God wants, God needs yes. right. for yes. me. And then we use that to manipulate other people. Right. And you're right. I mean, we don't always do that with this like evil, you know, we don't sit there and like right. wring our hands and think like, <laughs> ah, I know I'll manipulate them. Well, right. I, I knew a young musician who was saying, well, you know, just pray that God will allow this sample tape because I can really minister to people for the kingdom of my music. Be-. And basically, he wants to become, you know, a famous, a famous musician. Oh, mm-hmm. But yeah. in his mind... It was God who was, tr- God needed him to do his music. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, so it's definitely the, you want to say, and uh, God also wants you to get nuts. Is that correct? Yeah, it's very much <laughs> that line that you read. <laughs> yeah. There's also, it's interesting in that, in that scenario where the ape is talking to all of them and he wants more nuts. They're, they're wondering, you know, why are you enslaving us? And why are you in, uh, selling us off to the Tisrock and the Calermines? And, and why are we cutting down all these trees? Which I want to talk about that in just a second. Mm-hmm. And he says, oh, because I'm going to bring you civil civilization and we're going to have right. roads yes. and schools right. and they I have they have this great line they say well we don't want that you know yeah. we, we want this <laughs> and it's it feels like lewis is once again kind of satirizing that idea of progress for progress sake right. um, is not necessarily an improvement at what point do we start to think well maybe this isn't actually going to make us any happier we're just doing this because we feel like we need progress or civilization but well, the, the, the monkey's learned- idea is like more oranges and more bananas and right. roads <laughs> <laughs> to travel the road that we're just in the bananas you know and schools we talked about how lewis schools, is anti schools yes. yeah well, every time that comes up, Edmund does that in line with the wardrobe. He says, I'm going to make Narnia different. We're going to pave things and we're yeah. have institutions and cinemas. And then Uncle Andrew dreams about that in Silver Chair. Yeah. He, anytime uh, somebody, I wonder what Lewis thought of developers. I wonder if he thought they were Ooh. diabolical. Well, that's, <laughs> I think that that stood out to me because you have that scene where everything turns. Tyrion is at this cabin with Jewel and then this dryad comes in and is telling them yes. about all these oh. trees are being cut down and then he, the dryad is cut down and disappears and that kicks off Tyrion and Jewel going to try and in that chapter on the rashness of the king but that moment of them felling all these trees right. and how that is a great evil that can, he cannot yes. let go you know unanswered I think you know we we too easily clear forest here and we don't even see that as an evil right. Lewis seems like has that idea of let's cut down all these trees and make a parking lot yeah, yeah pay hey. paradise and and uh, put up a parking lot. Right, yeah. right. Both, both Lewis and Tolkien, Oxford really changed during their lifetime. It was kind of mm. a sleepy academic community when they first got there in the 20s. But more and more, there was development in suburbs. The Kilns had eight acres. It had its own woods and its own pond. Uh-huh. And now it's almost like a regular plot you would see in, oh, in America. Really? Everything's been sold off to developers. Uh. Yeah, so I'm sure they both felt. Tolkien used to write letters to the paper saying, "Why does this road need to be paved? What's wrong with gravel? And why does this? What do these woods need to be cleared?" Yeah, you see that in that hideous strength as well. With right. the of wood. course, right. the, how nature was so important to C.S. Lewis's faith journey. Yeah. So the first part of the book, when the shifty ape is playing the role of Auntie Aslan. That's the time of the destruction of nature. And then the moment of redemption where at the very end of the novel, where you're going further up and further in, it's just all this celebration of this beauty of nature and becoming one with nature. Yeah. Um, I love that image where they, they were going up a waterfall and yes. it was just like they were part of the waterfall. Right. Yeah. So right. throughout these novels, nature is extremely important. Do you Is that the same waterfall on the same pool that appears in the beginning of the story where they find the lion skin and Puzzle goes out to swim? Is that the same waterfall and I pool, David? So. Well, they're in the new Narn. Well, oh, that's uh, right. It's a new Narnia. But the counterpart of it right. in the new Narnia, is that the same cold yeah, pool? Yeah, Cauldron Pool yeah. later on, I'm pretty yeah. sure. Right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
I just, I, I didn't, I made that connection as I was reading the end of the book and I didn't go back to look at the front. So, yeah. Well, it's interesting that in all of his books, uh, when he tries to portray heaven, it's always foothills leading to mountains. It's never the new Jerusalem. He could have easily said, and here's the new Carapel. I know. And it's twice as cool as the, but he just gets away from cities altogether yeah. or castles. Well, I want to talk about that more later, but uh, let's get back to the main part of the novel. Okay. I wanted to get back to the, the monkey and that scene where he's kind of holding court. And right. he's convincing them because there's a very important moment that people have talked a lot about from this book that has been somewhat controversial. Mm. And uh, it's when the lamb, that little lamb comes forward. Right. Yes. right. And he says, what have we to do with the Calarmines? We belong to Aslan. They belong to Tash. They have a god called Tash. They say he has four arms and the head of a vulture. They kill men on his altar. I don't believe there's any such person as Tash. But if there was, how could Aslan be friends with him? Mm. And the response that he gets from the ape is, Tash is only another name for Aslan. All that old idea of us being right and the Calarmines being wrong is silly. We know better now. The Calarmines use different words, but we all mean the same thing. Mm -hmm. And towards the end of the novel, they just start calling him Tashlan. Right. Yeah, um, right. Yeah. They just combine the two. Um, right. And that, that concept and then the sort of corresponding journey of Emeth Yes. And the novel becomes a big thing because the whole discussion between uh, Islam and God and are they the same is a big controversy. So what do you guys think about that? Um, what is Lewis trying to portray here? Obviously, this is something that people pull out and they make different commentaries on. Mm -hmm. Why don't you start, David? Because I have a lot to say. OK. Well, <laughs> OK. Uh, Lewis said in the letter that we know that uh, all need to be saved by the blood of Christ, but you don't necessarily need to know about about Christ's atoning work in order to be saved. So he believed that there were people in other cultures who could be drawn to Aslan or drawn to Christ. And we definitely need to talk about the Imeth yeah. uh, episode. Yeah. Uh, but he also said he didn't think that all religions were false. They were simply partial illuminations. And Christianity with the incarnation and the Trinity was the, the truths that other religions were perfected and mm. clarified in Christianity. He's obviously satirizing this comparative religions movement. Mm -hmm. If you ever read uh, yeah. Houston Smith, there's kind of a feeling that every religion is a road to heaven and everybody yeah. has partial insights. Oh, yeah. Which and of Lewis course is wanted what, to get away from that idea. What Lewis himself once thought, that it, you know, all mm. these religions have yeah, a dying God myth, you right, know, right. Christianity is no different than other religions. And yeah. it was that walk with Tolkien and Hugo Dyson, Hugo yeah. Dyson yeah. where he suddenly realized that, oh, they have little glimmers of the truth. But in Christianity, myth became fact. Yeah. And there are a number of religions where that is what their teaching is, is that they're all names for the same thing. Right, right. 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 This whole idea that all religions lead to the same God, which yeah. you're, you hear a lot today, even among Christians. And clearly, Lewis is not endorsing that, that Christianity is distinctive from all other religions. And the reason I have a lot to say about this is I've thought a lot about it be because of Dorothy Sayers. She was concerned about this issue as well. So I dedicate a whole chapter of my recent book, Subversive, to this issue, oh. showing what how Christians today can easily answer this idea that all religions lead to the same God. And oh, okay. part of it has to do with, and I've brought this up on other podcasts, that the majority of religions operate according to to what a famous philosopher called an economy of exchange. Mm -hmm. You got to do this to get that. You've got to um, bring me nuts in order <laughs> to get to my yeah. favor. You And Christianity distinguishes itself from the other religions by saying, no, salvation is a gift, not because of works, lest anyone should boast. Yeah. And it is a gift that is offered in love. And it's not something that you gain in exchange for belief, yeah. because that can be just as exchanges. But in order to accept a gift, the gift of salvation offered by Jesus Christ, you have to believe it's been offered to you because you can't accept a gift unless yeah. you actually believe it's been offered. And you have Otherwise, to you, you don't even notice it. And you have to receive it. Yeah, exactly. Right. And so I really think... 
that is molding. That is the fundamental assumption behind what Lewis is doing in this book, which helps explain Emmeth at the end. And I don't know if we want to talk about Emmeth now or... Let's talk about him now. Let's talk about Emmeth. So in light of that, then, Emmeth distinguishes himself, even though he's followed Tash his whole life, it's clear from what he says, he doesn't do it in a as an economy of exchange. Oh, I got to go through these rites. I got to say these words. I got to practice these things. And I've been doing it all my life. But he has been um, loving Tash and serving him to the best of his ability, not in order to get something in exchange. And Aslan recognizes that about him. Mm. And it, it's as though Lewis is saying, well, if Jesus Christ offers us the gift of salvation. What about people who never even heard about the gift? Yeah. What about people who um, grew up in other countries, other religions, where Christianity was just presented as just another exchangeous religion that you got to do this if you want to be saved? Uh-huh. So he is, by Ameth's suddenly recognizing that Aslan is the true God and despairing over the fact, oh no, I've been worshiping Tash my whole life. Lewis is showing that people who recognize that there is a God, a creator who they want to know better. Mm. If they've never heard the Christian message, God honors that. And there's major biblical support for this, of course. Mm. Just read Matthew 25. It's um, laid out there. Which Lewis quoted several times in his letters. Uh, interesting. Um, you know, welcome, you fed me when I was in jail, you visited me when I was hungry. Yeah. And they say, when did we ever feed you? Well, if you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. Yeah. Right. But then the negative part is people who think they're saved and right. he says, well, yeah. you didn't visit me in prison, you didn't I, feed me. I think also a good uh, counterpart, rather than thinking of this in terms of sort of like, well, um, is he talking about a, a Muslim person that maybe is worshiping Allah and unbeknownst he's worshiping um, uh, Yahweh, um, maybe the centurion that comes to Jesus. And so, you know, he's a Gentile and he's a Roman and he's not, you know, he's not a Jew. Mm-hmm. Um, and But you do have this example of him coming to Jesus and he says, well, I believe that you can heal my servant. You know, mm-hmm. obviously he knows that Jesus has access to God somehow. And, and he's like, oh, well, you know, you don't have to come with me. You know, I know that you can just say it and it'll be true. And so he has faith in Jesus. Although what mm-hmm. Lewis is dealing with is for people who haven't even expo- been exposed no, I know. to Jesus. Yeah. or Aslan. But I think it complicates it if you turn it into that question because then his statement about uh, Tash and Aslan not being the same God, it gets kind of confusing a little bit. I, that's where I think mm-hmm. people can um, misinterpret what Lewis is trying right. to get right, at. Here, right, right, right. Yes, he was an inclusivist. But he wasn't a universalist. Right. And he definitely didn't think that all religions lead to God. There is a verse in Romans where it says when people do what the law requires without knowing the law in the time of judgment, yeah. their conscience may accuse them or excuse them. So once again, in Romans, Paul seems to leave open the door for people who haven't gotten the explicit mm-hmm. uh, gospel. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the name Emmet means faithful, by the way. Oh. And I think the most important part of that scene is when Aslan says, uh, everything you, every work of compassion yes. and honor yeah. you did in the name of Tash, you actually did for me. Right. And when people do things that are selfish and cruel in the name of Aslan, they're actually doing it in the name of Tash. Mm-hmm. Which uh, sends us back to the beginning of the novel where mm-hmm. you just have people um, doing things that serve their interests, especially the ape. Yeah using the name of Aslan to justify what yeah. they want. Right. So there's there's a lot of things that happen here in terms of battles and fighting. But to me, one of the other interesting moments in the novel is when Tyrion is tied up on this tree and he calls out to right. Aslan, yes. Aslan, Aslan, Aslan. And then he has this moment where he sees these seven figures. And initially, we don't know who these seven figures are. And then eventually uh, Eustace and Jill come. So let's talk about that a little bit. I thought that was a very interesting scene, particularly when he, he starts feeling sorry for himself, which reminds me a lot of Ransom and Paralandro. He starts mm-hmm. feeling sorry for himself before he has this faith breakthrough. But he also goes back and he thinks about all the stories of all his forefathers and kings. And he thinks of Caspian. And he keeps saying, it's not like that with me. That sort of thing doesn't happen now. That story, too, had all come right in the end. And Aslan had come into that story a lot. He has come into all the other stories, too. But there's, there's this 
sense that, well, he's not going to come. And then he has this hope and he calls out to Aslan, come and help us now. And then eventually he, um, Aslan does come mm. through for him. Right. I thought that was a very moving moment. And yeah. Novel, almost a conversion mm. moment for yeah. him. Yeah. Right. And uh, this reinforces what I was talking about in terms of the economy of exchange insofar as Lewis has uh, Tyrion say, let me be killed. I ask nothing for myself, but come and save all of Narnia. So he is not seeking Aslan for his own um, self-interest, Mm-hmm. that he is calling on Aslan as an act of love. And what I love afterwards is that we're told, or Lewis tells us, there began to be a kind of change inside Tyrion. Yeah. And that's the first thing that is noticed. I think there is a powerful uh, implication about prayer, and Christians fall into this where they just pray for things they want. Oh, dear God, I pray that this I'll pass my exam. Uh Oh, dear God, help me find the perfect mate. Dear God. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as your prayer life isn't just totally focused on yourself. But the point of prayer is about changing us on the inside. Mm -hmm. And this is what Lewis shows here. And that, again, correlates with this thematic structure of the book on the difference between the inside of a person versus external experience. Um, appearances. Yeah. So people think puzzle with this artificial lion's coat is really Aslan. They're just judging by surfaces. Yeah. You know, that famous verse, humans look on the outer appearances, God looks on the heart. Yeah. And there's definitely a, a, a clear contrast between true believers and true servants of Aslan and those that are just using him in order to get what they want in the right. story and going right. along with it. There's also right. a reaction to Aslan. Uh, Imeth says, well, I would rather be destroyed by you. Uh, this uh-huh. comes up a lot. You remember when uh, Huyn first saw Aslan the lion, he says, I would rather be eaten by you than to survive. There's uh, this yeah. kind of numinous mm. attraction. When you meet Aslan, if your spirit is aligned, you immediately are attracted to his warmth and radiance and goodness. So I think that's another example. Later on, when they have the judgment scene, it's really not a judgment scene where Aslan sends them to the left to the right, but it's an acknowledgement scene. And the key thing is how they react to Aslan rather than him reacting to them. Yeah. Once again, there's this whole uh, mm. myth that there's some kind of heavenly auditor who keeps track yeah. of all your <laughs> assets Once and again, liabilities. Once again, economic, and, an economy of exchange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Sorry, you didn't tick up enough uh, proper rituals to get into heaven. You right. know, when I was little, there was this special that uh, PBS put on that was a Sesame Street special or something. And there's this scene where there's this Egyptian boy and they have to go rescue him and then they take him of the afterlife and his heart has to weigh less than a feather and oh right and there's this scene where you know like is it gonna go you know yeah. and if, if his heart weighs more than a feather then he doesn't get to go into the afterlife and I growing up in a you know very conservative household there's definitely that fear of well are these you know these sins are going to prevent me from going into mm. heaven in the sense that you kind of ha- you had to be perfect on your own and if you messed up then you like mm-hmm. messed up your chance to get into heaven mm-hmm. and, so and I kind of had the opposite problem growing up in so far far as it was a different kind of economy of exchange where I still remember as a child, I would tell a lie, like if I had stolen a key or something. (laughs) And um, I remember thinking, oh, it doesn't matter if I tell lies because I've asked Jesus into my heart. So I've paid the proper coin. I put that coin in the salvation meter and that coin is there. So so I can do. Yes. And I think that is relevant here as well. I love going back to um, David's example of the people going through the door and some going to the left and to the right. It reminds me of a line, once again, from Sayers in this chapter on um, how do you respond to people who simplistically say that all religions lead to the same God and how how can you argue against that? And she makes the point, and I think uh, Lewis is implying this here, that God sends no one to hell. Mm. Everyone who is in hell chose 
to be there because they chose self-interest over choosing to know their creator. You see that with the dwarfs. Yes. Mm-hmm. When they're yes. in the stable at the end and, you know, the dwarfs are for the dwarfs. And, yes. uh, and they, as you know, they say, well, what can you do for them? And Aslan tries to communicate and reveal himself to them and they just can't see it. They can't perceive it because they're not looking and they're not willing to sort of open their eyes. Once again, that reminds me of a George MacDonald principle. Rather than seeing is believing, it's believing is seeing. Yes. Yeah. Curdy can't see uh, Queen Irene in the attic because he doesn't believe there's anything happening up there. It takes him a while to see her. O'Rule just momentarily saw the palace yeah. where uh, Psyche is living with the god Cupid, but she poo-poos it and puts it out of her mind and doesn't even mention it to the yeah. fox. So once again, we have that principle that believing is seeing. That's actually one of the most humorous parts. You're in this beautiful, glorious new Narnia. <laughs> And they think everything is straw and they think, you know, they yeah. uh, they just insist upon seeing things according to their preconceptions. Yeah, which is actually reminds me of the passage where Paul talks about um, all our good deeds are like straw and they'll be burnt right, up. Right. And uh, and they're being they're being given all these wonderful things to eat and consume this feast by Aslan. And they think it's straw and, you know, they right. there's flowers that Lucy tries to put in their face and they're like, right. why would you, you know, stick straw <laughs> in my face? Yeah. You know? And it's the dwarves who say, the dwarves are for the dwarves that Lewis has one say that seeing is believing. Yeah. So yeah, that right. famous line, and again, the line that you hear today to say, well, we should just only believe things that can be empirically verifiable. Science gets us to the truth. You superstitious Christians not realizing how much a basic principle in life is believing it is seeing. Yeah. The way you believe something will work affects your experience of it. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the end of the novel, but I wanted to mention something that you brought up on an earlier podcast, David. You had mentioned that you wanted to write, uh, obviously you wouldn't get the approval to, this story about how Narnia got the Lone Islands. Right, they conquered right. the Lone Islands. And it is funny that there is this sketch here. You know, Jewel is talking to Jill and he's trying to point out that the humans only show up when things are really bad in, in Narnia. And normally things are pretty calm and and wonderful. But he gives this sketch of, it's almost like an appendix in plain sight. Tolkien has these appendices with all these extra stories right. and stuff. They're going to make a whole Amazon series based on the appendices and wow. <laughs> the um, Silmarillion. But there's this story we get of how they conquered the Lone Islands. It's like the seventh descent, uh, descendant of Frank or something. And I thought that was <laughs> neat because I, I thought, boy, you could write a whole series of novels based uh. on these little sketches. Yeah, the, the thing about Swan White. Lewis made the point in Miracles. People say, well, Miracles don't happen anymore and the Bible's full of miracles but how come we don't see any miracles? And Lewis said if you take an actual chronology of the Old and New Testaments from about 2000 BC to, you know, 33 AD, there's only certain periods which are full of miracles. They have they have mm-hmm. several generations where everyone just lives by faith. Nobody sees a manifestation of, yeah. of the, div- the divine. And I think he's kind of saying that here too. The, the books mm-hmm. we see, Aslan is moving because in miracles, he called them the ganglia of history, these nerve centers where very important things are happening. Oh. So the seven articles we're seeing are the times in which Narnia is in trouble and there needs to be some kind of interaction between Earth and Narnia to put things right. Yeah. Celts talk about thin places. And when you talk about when he prayed to Aslan, he suddenly saw the seven friends of Narnia yeah. and they could see him. It's kind of like there's this thin membrane between Narnia and Earth. And when these certain spiritual moments, you can see into the other world. Mm. But I had never really thought about that. He, I guess he does talk about that in Miracles about those, because it's not like they're happening all the time. Right. And these, right. it is funny how they are reciting on the history of these things. And what you read in the stories for Tyrion is this great story about Caspian or about Rillian and they're these great stories almost like the stories we read in the Bible and they're like yeah we were there for that right yeah yeah. (laughs) right and sometimes Uh, we are encountering miracles without being aware of it I'm thinking of an incident that's actually related to something in this novel David and I took a group of students to Israel with us way long time ago when we lived on the west coast I think that's when Herod was king (laughs) (laughs) And... 
The person who was our guide, a, a Christian, loved to camp out on the Sinai Peninsula. Oh, wow. And he said that still to this day in the Sinai are things that look like rocks because there's this, this calcification over a spring. And all you have to do is take a stick and whack these what looks like rocks and water will pour forth. Forth, which, huh. of course, reminds us of Moses leading the children through the wilderness on the way to the promised land. So God is using natural processes, but the real miracle is the miracle of time. Right when the people needed the water, yeah. there was one of these natural phenomenon. Huh. I didn't know that was a real thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he says it's like calcium. Calcium deposits that build up as the water trickles out little by little, it builds up a calcium deposit, which actually starts blocking the water. And yeah. So. Oh. And I think all of us have had that experience of this amazing timing where just the right person came in at the right time. And yeah. we get attuned to want really showy ideas of miracles like, yeah. oh, you know, let that bush start burning and never be <laughs> burned up. Yeah. Not but- that those miracles don't happen. Happen, but I think there we are surrounded much more by miracles than we are even aware. I think it's also a sense of we we rec- in those moments we recognize that we can't accomplish this on our own, and so all of a sudden we're acutely aware that we need God to come through or provide for us or give us something. Mm. And then when He does, we recognize it, but we assume that the rest of our lives we're just sort of going about yes, and we're right. doing everything yes. ourselves. And it's I think partly exactly. it's because our need isn't as great. It's like if I need food, I'll just go to the grocery store. Yeah. I don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> cry out to Aslan to provide me with food or there's that moment in the in the novel where they uh, there's water that actually comes from a rock you know that white rock um, in that battle scene and Jill drinks from it and it reminded me of that, that scene yes that's uh, why yeah, I said uh, it was similar yeah there's several uh, allusions to Exodus I think when uh, Tyrion and Jewel kill the two uh, Calarmines who are using talking horses as slaves. That reminds you of when Moses was so angry at the uh, slave uh, who was lashing. I mean, yeah. the slave mm-hmm. owner, the Egyptian. Oh, right. Yeah. So the, I think, and the the rock definitely is another allusion to the Book of Exodus. Yeah. Oh, and that goes back to this image of people going to the right and left of Aslan as they come through the door. And I was touched by the fact that one of the, I believe it was a dwarf who actually killed a one of the horses, one of the talking horses, even he was welcomed into Aslan's presence oh, because yeah. he accepted Aslan's gift. And that comfort that no matter how much you have messed up in life, you have been blind, you've put your faith elsewhere, yeah. that there is this moment where Christ will offer us that final recognition that this is God. Yeah. This is the lion, um, God incarnate or God in lionate. <laughs> <laughs> and you embrace it. Yeah. Even Saul was forgiven for persecuting and, and killing yeah. the Christians. Oh my goodness. It becomes Paul. Um, yeah. There's also a moment where uh, the, uh, what's the name of the, the Calarmine that's the that Rishta, is that what his name is? Yeah. Oh, right. Rishta Tarkan. Yeah, yeah. Rishta Tarkan. He wants the ape to do his final performance. And he says yes. to the ape, hold up thy head. And it reminded me of when, when Joseph is talking to the chief baker, he says that same line, oh. hold up thy head. And he interprets this dream, but the dream is that uh, the baker is going to be killed by Pharaoh. And I'm like, oh, is Lewis foreshadowing that there? But that line, hold up thy head, is it appears mm-hmm. in scripture as mm-hmm. well. Uh, uh-huh. So uh-huh. Lewis has a lot of those kind of biblical allusions yeah. in that section. Yeah. Well, we were talking about uh, how you can't be sure who's going to be welcomed into the, the new Narnian, who's not. And so the dwarf who killed the horse is there. Imeth is there. But Susan is not there. Right. We need to talk about the uh, mm. Susan is no longer a friend of Narnia. Yeah, that's uh, that's kind of mm. sad. And people have criticized Lewis right. for his his depiction of why Susan doesn't make it into, into the new Narnia. Mm. Yeah, a lot of people think it's misogynistic because she, she wants to grow up and wear lipstick and that yeah. sort of thing. I think in Lewis's defense, at about the same age as Susan, he said when he was in middle school, or what we would call middle school. He said, I became a cad, a fop, and a snob. Uh And he said he had a period of his life he was very self-important and snobbish and wanted to be what we would say cool. So I don't think it's tied to gender. She gets to a phase of false sophistication. Gotcha. 
Because so many of his most despicable characters are male. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So he's just trying to portray that, that, that idea of self-importance and vanity in her. Right. And and for her, it takes that manifestation. He said in a letter to a child, there's no reason she can't eventually get to the new Narnia. And he says, why don't you write a story and you explain how Susan makes her way to Narnia? Oh, that's really sweet. You talked earlier about the Lone Islands. Before I knew that there was this anathema against it, I had an idea that would that Susan would come and she would be involved in killing the dragon at the Lone Islands and then she would get back to Nunarni and meet her siblings oh, okay. on a, by a different path. And I sent that uh, novel sketch to my agent and said, could you forward this to Harper Collins and see if, what they think about it? And the message was basically, if you try to publish this, not only will we sue you, we will come to your house and break your legs. <laughs> <laughs> So I dropped that idea. Okay. <laughs> All right. But Lewis didn't think she needed to be permanently banned from be, uh, joining her siblings in gotcha. the new Narnia. Well, he uh-huh. does say in the, in the story that, well, she just needs to grow up more. Right. right. She's right. trying to act like a grown up, but she just needs to grow up more. And then right. she can be here. I thought that was right. interesting. Right. Well, let's talk about the end. Okay, I I have a question first that's kind of getting towards the end. One of the things that baffles me about this novel is the role of Ginger the cat. I can't figure out why he was there. And I wonder if either of you have theories. I think he's kind of the false prophet from the book of Revelation. At least that's what I thought. Oh, okay. Because there there are several of those kinds of figures in the book of Revelation. Um, You know, there's the Elijah comes back, but then there's the the Antichrist and the false prophet. And I kind of... Of saw the cat playing that false prophet kind of a role there. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. He actually had a cat named Ginger, a big tom oh. named Ginger. <laughs> So I'm sure the cat appreciates being placed in that role. He actually talks about how he couldn't understand the cruelty of cats. They would catch something and then they would play with it mm. and pretend like it was going to escape. And then, so he thought there was something a little cruel about cats, and the way sinister. they would play with their, yeah, sinister. Yeah. So I think that maybe his. Whereas he has this adorable view of the dogs, the talking dogs, yeah. where he yes. says, even talking dogs are very doggy. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all licking, jumping. Jumping and licking. Yes. And, oh, it's so cute. Well, yeah. he loved animals. He said in one letter that you should raise dogs and cats together because it broadens their minds. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's sweet. Okay, back to your question about the ending. Yeah, so let's talk about the end. There's obviously a lot to talk about. Um, there's this new Narnia. Lewis is, um, is, uh, has a picture here. I also like the fact that they recognize there's value in mourning uh, the loss of Narnia, the mm-hmm. old Narnia. Mm-hmm. Um, and a number of times throughout the novel, they console themselves because they recognize that this is the end and Narnia is about to come to an end. And so there's a line where they say, all worlds draw to an end and noble death is a treasure which no one is too poor to buy. And so mm. they're of embracing the end and embracing this fight and they're going to do this for Aslan and even if it costs them their lives, they're willing to die. And I love the line that they keep saying that uh, they're going to proclaim the truth and take the adventure that Aslan sends us. Mm. And so there's this willingness to sort of step yes. into uh, the the next phase of existence. Right. Um than the story. And then obviously they go into the stable and inside the stable is a whole other world. And there's this concept of going into a space and it's actually somehow bigger on the inside yeah. that Lewis talks about there. Uh, so let's talk about that and let's talk about the new Narnia and also the death of Narnia. I love the moment where the stars come uh-huh. down yes. and they land and they're actually people, you know? Yes, yeah. making As a I hissing noise yeah. when they've come to earth. Wonderful detail. Yeah. Well, that goes back to our earlier conversation about believing is seeing. So those who believe in the creator God see this realm of salvation and those who don't are in the dark. And he says that there was another stable that was much bigger on the inside than on the outside. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it goes back, we had that discussion of, about meditation in a tool shed. That when you look yes. at something, it's different than looking along it. Yeah. And so you look at the stable. There's actually a passage which seems to recall that essay again. Um, when you get rightly aligned, you see the, the all of Narnia. The same thing happened to Magician's Nephew. There's this little small island with a tree on it. But once you got there, it was much bigger. Even the whole idea of the wardrobe, there's an entire world on the contained inside. in the inside of a wardrobe. Yeah. And I think sometimes people look at Christians sociologically and say, well, here's the group and here's their percentage of Americans and here's different denominations. And they never really look alongside what it's like to be a Christian, uh-huh. to believe in a benevolent God. 
God who's controlling things, uh, to believe that even little incidents in your life might be providences. Lewis, in a letter, talked about uh, all day he was thinking, you know, I need to go see my, this friend. It's been a long time and I'm not sure how he's doing. And he kept thinking, well, I'm so busy, but he couldn't get that thought out of his mind. And then he went to visit the friend. And when he, the friend came to the door, he said, oh, Lewis, I've been praying that you would come see me. Oh, wow. And he asked, now, where's the free will and determinism? Nobody made me go see him that day. But it's interesting that I had this idea in my mind all day that I needed to go visit him. And then mm-hmm. sure enough, he, that's what he was praying mm-hmm. about. And that's a very different way to live your life, to feel that God might, the spirit might be nudging you to do something mm-hmm. rather than to think that everything is just human psychology and yeah. uh, materialistic right. forces. Right. Yeah. The part that reminded me of meditation in a tool shed is the on the same page as where they talk about it's bigger on the inside than the outside. And they are discussing the fact that the door is just standing there, you know, in the middle. Supporting it, yeah. Yeah. Like right. it grew um, from the ground. Whereas right. it seems to be a door leading from nowhere to nowhere. And but then Peter responds, it looks like that if you walk around it. But put your eye to that place Mm -hmm. where there is a crack between two of the planks and look through it. Yeah. Which is almost exactly what happens in meditation and a tool shed. That you can see this whole realm outside the tool shed if you put your eye to the crack in the the wood of the shed. And there's another concept that Lewis is drawing on here that I want to talk about for just a second, because I think that it's something that we can get. uh, It's a doctrine that I think is misunderstood among Protestants. And so the way that Lewis portrays the new Narnia, the new heaven and the new Narnia in the story can get uh, misconstrued. um, And it's it's made worse by the fact that he explicitly evokes Plato right. here at the yeah. end, or uh, Diggory yeah. does. And it's this idea of sacramentalism. Uh, so Lewis is trying to, com- and he talks about this in his essay, uh, Transposition. And mm. he's conveying this idea. Uh, there's a couple places where it appears in scripture. So I think it's Hebrews 10, 1 and Colossians 2, 17, I think. This idea that um, uh, the things that we see are a shadow or a copy of the true thing. And so mm. in Hebrews, it's the law and it's the Sabbath and it's the temple is is an image of uh, or a reflection, um, a pale reflection of the true thing. Um, and the tendency, I think, can be for some people when you bring Plato in, because there's this mm-hmm. whole thing of Plato's cave. And we talked about that in um, Silver Chair. And they have this moment where they're trying to be uh, misled by the green lady into thinking that everything they had experienced was just an illusion and there's no such thing as above ground. And what happens is you can buy into this dichotomy where you think, well, everything that we see now is an illusion. Right. It's not real. That the real heaven and the real, you know, the real um, Wheaton or the, <laughs> the real England is someplace else. And this is just some sort of false illusion. Mm-hmm. Um, and you see this also in some sort of Eastern religions and Buddhism right. and things like that. And um, Lewis, I think, and I want to give him all the credit here, is trying to embrace more of a orthodox perspective, a sort of sacramentalism where uh, what needs to happen is we need to be made more real. Yes. That this world is real, that Christ did take on uh, flesh. He became a man yes. so that we could become like God's. Athanasius's idea. And so because of that, it doesn't mean that the flesh that Christ took on was false or illusory. And we've talked about that before with docetism. But by invoking Plato, it kind of muddies the waters a little bit mm-hmm. because Plato's cave is, I would I would argue that it's not a Christian perspective on things. And it can lead people to this idea that the world that we see and everything around us is, and we use terms like fleeting and it's passing. And it leads people to sort of treat the world as if it's disposable, it's not real, it's fake. Um, when I think what Lewis is trying to convey is that these things have meaning and they have value because they come from a higher reality, and which is why you see in scripture, heaven comes down and heaven mm. and earth are united and the earth is made more real mm-hmm. by being united with the mm. uh, the other side that is the heavenly copy of things and they come together. Mm. Which is opposite of Plato's cave where you have to leave the cave and climb out of it exactly. to the ideal realm. And you turn around and realize that everything was an illusion. Yeah. 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 So I think that's a, um, 
by evoking Plato here in the story, I think it kind of muddles things. There's a yeah. whole bunch of essays that I found, uh, scholarly essays, some that were pre- presented at a Taylor conference and stuff where people talk about Plato and Platonism and the last battle. We don't need to get into all that, but I just thought that um, that idea and the way that Lewis portrays it uh, can be very positive. But if you don't understand everything's mm-hmm. going on there, um, Protestants who don't understand sacramentalism can sort of misread that. In fact, a lot of the early church heresies were based on Platonism. Right. The idea that Christ couldn't have actually been physically embodied in the flesh. That's that's a Platonistic hang up. You know, how could right. something from the realm of forms or ideas come to, to earth, the material world? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, some in the early church, some Christians were or Christians in general were criticized because they weren't Platonic, because Platonism is foundationalism. And Christians were saying, No, we don't trust this overriding system. We trust God incarnate, that God took on flesh. Yeah, that matter matters. Yes. Matter matters. Uh, and you you do see that in the stories. Um, and what I like, I think one of the ways that Lewis reinforces that is the fact that they say, no, it's right for us to mourn and to feel sad for the loss of the mm-hmm. old Narnia because those things weren't um, less valid or less right. true or less real. Because it's God's creation. Yeah. Right. Um, but there's the sense in which it has to be destroyed for this new one to happen. And so that's slightly different than what you see portrayed in scripture. Um, but but, uh, but I really like the picture that he paints of them running yes. and not growing weary. Becoming one with nature. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And Just going further again, up and further in. Yeah. There's, there's that Bible verse about the young men shall run and not be weary. There's often these echoes of, of things happening in Narnia. Yeah. Um, it's clever how he sees Earth and Narnia as both kind of spurs coming out of the the mountain range, yes. which is the, the new Narnia. Yeah, and they don't know it, but they're all killed in a, in a train crash back in England. Yeah, there actually was a big, uh, well publicized. Uh, train oh. crash in England in the oh, 40s. Really? Yeah, so he may be referring to an incident where everybody's thinking of the tragedy of all these children being killed, but in his mind that allows them to go to the new Narnia oh. and be united with all their Narnian friends. Oh, wow. I made a fun discovery. Oh, okay. Oh. I, L- Lewis's middle name stands for Staples. <laughs> Is that what you discovered? Did he found Staples, <laughs> the exactly, office supply yeah. company? <laughs> no. I've always loved this concept of further up, further further in. Mm. It's just such a great way to think of just running and not being weary and becoming more and more aligned with our creator. And I noticed this time when I was reading the novel, the first time the idea comes up, it's further in and higher up. And then later it's changed Mm to um, further in, further up. Well, then I happened to be simultaneously reading Lilith by George MacDonald. And it is describing the experience of the protagonist after he dies and all he's going through, including a white rock that had a former stream coming down it. Oh, wow. And it says, as as he describes his experience, I was in the land of thought, farther in, higher up than the seven dimensions, the ten senses. I think I was where I am in the heart of God. The exact same words. Mm. Lewis is quoting Mm. straight out of Lilith, farther in, higher up. But then, after that first time where he has the centaur, Runewit, say it, then it gets changed to further up, further in. Interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. I I know that myself. There's a a, a good book that came out recently by Edith Humphrey uh, called Further Up, Further In that's uh, uh, has a series of essays on sort of orthodox theology and mm. uh, and Lewis's writings. And they, they talk a little bit about the novels. I think Lewis is trying to evoke this idea of that you see in Eastern Orthodox of theosis. Yes. Mm. Mm. When you see this in Athanasius, I referenced him earlier, that God became man so that we could become like yeah. God or gods ourselves, lowercase g gods. And so there's this idea of becoming more and more like God. God, Mm -hmm. even in the life after life. And so just because you get to heaven or to the new heaven or the new Narnia here, you don't just sit and hang out, but we need to go further up and further in that we become more and more and grow closer and closer uh, to God, even in in the afterlife. So, yeah. Yeah, Lewis said in Mere Christianity, I must keep alive in myself my desire for my own true country. 
And then yes. I think it's interesting. Is it Jewel who said, oh, this is the, the country I've been yes. seeking my whole life. Yes. Uh, we have no abiding city. And so I, that was a wonderful line. Of, right. Once again, it's fascinating to look at Lewis's fiction and his nonfiction and see how coherent his intellect and his imagination were. Yeah. Mm. It is interesting to me that in the story here, he evokes the emperor over the sea and the father. And you don't get the sort of explicit trinity I mean, it's hinted at throughout the novels, but you don't really see that in this in the end mm. here. We still only encounter Aslan mm -hmm. uh, in the new Narnia at the end of the novel, mm -hmm. but there's definitely this implication that there's more to explore and, mm -hmm. and more to encounter. Yeah, the Trinity is not an easy concept to <laughs> explain. In fact, my uh, fourth book is on film. It's called Salvation from Cinema, and it is talking about this field known as religion and film, and I actually talk about the Trinity in the book. And one of the anonymous referees, those are the people who read a book to decide whether it should be published, was a religion professor. And she actually wrote back and she says, yes, this book should be published, but I don't have the time to explain the Trinity to my students. <laughs> <laughs> So I think Lewis realized yeah. that you're getting the, the essentials of the redemption message yeah. and, and theosis. I think you're exactly right yeah. to bring up theosis from the Eastern tradition. But he does a good job of... Uh, painting these pictures that evoke this sense of this desire for the right. true country. Uh, and it's very beautiful at the end of the story. Well, as we wrap up the this novel and the whole series, uh, what are our takeaways? What what do you guys want to want to talk about as we wrap up? Well, I uh, wanted to mention that his, his friend and biographer, George Sayer, said that I've read all of Lewis's books and you actually get the clearest picture of his view of the divine in the Narnia Chronicles. Mm. Even though he really tackles theology and mere mm. Christianity and miracles, he said, if you really want to know how Lewis thought about God, read his depiction of Aslan. Mm. And I think that's interesting that yes. Lewis was able to fulfill his vision of God's complexity in fiction better than he could in expository writing. Sometimes when he was writing to children, Lewis would say, well, if Aslan wills it, this will happen or that mm. will happen. So it really became a part of his vocabulary of understanding his own faith. Oh, yes. wow. Yeah. Yeah. The Oxford uh, Encyclopedia of Children's Literature said that the Narnia Chronicles were the most sustained achievement in children's literature in the 20th century. Uh, I didn't discover the Narnia Chronicles myself until I was in college, and I was so excited about them and stimulated, I read all seven of them in two weeks. Oh, wow. And then I was really sorry they were over. And I felt like there was something missing in my life. And I went back and reread all seven of them the next two weeks. Oh, wow. So within a month, I went from having never read Narnia to reading it <laughs> twice. Wow. But in some ways, there's a passage in The Voyage of the Dawn Treader where he's speaking to Lucy. And I feel like he's actually speaking to all of us in this passage. Oh. And she says, please, Aslan, said Lucy, before we go, will you tell us when we can come back in Narnia again? Please. Oh, do, do, do make it soon. Dearest, said Aslan very gently, you and your brother will never come back to Narnia. Oh, Aslan, said Edmund and Lucy in despairing voices. You're two old children, said Aslan, and you must begin to come close to your own world now. Oh. It isn't Narnia, you know, sobbed Lucy. It's you. We shan't meet you there. And how can we live never meeting you? But you shall meet me, dear one, said Aslan. Are, are you there too, sir, said Edmund? I am, said Aslan. But there I have another name. You must learn to know me by that name. That was the very reason why you were brought to Narnia, that by knowing me here for a little, you may know me better there. And I think his last words to Edmund and Lucy are also his uh, strategy for the whole Narnia Chronicles, that we can learn to meet Aslan a little bit in Narnia and come back and recognize his other name here on Earth. Yeah, definitely. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Chris. The Wade Center podcast is a production of the Marion E. Wade Center at Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois. Our hosts are the co-directors of the Wade Center, Drs. Crystal and David C. Downing. Our episodes are produced and edited by Aaron M. Hill. If you enjoy the podcast and the content we offer, please leave us a review on iTunes, tell your friends, and consider making a donation to The Wade. The Wade Center is entirely self-funded. Financial gifts help support the expert services, fast collections, and varied programming we offer at no cost. If you have questions about the podcast or suggestions for future episodes, please email us at wade at wheaton.edu. 
or contact us via Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. To learn more about the Wade Center, our seven British Christian authors, what we offer, and how to make a donation, visit our website at wheaton.edu slash wade.